you know, as long as the population isn't, you know, dropping dramatically in a particular market, there's always going to be demand. And as population is, you know, increasing or even staying steady, I can go to pretty much any market and, and, and probably find a lot of ground where there's a demand for storage that is not being met and there, and there needs to be a development. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. Hey guys, I'm your host, Sean Graham, with The Gentle Art of Crushing It. And like all my podcasts, we focus on self-storage. So today I had the pleasure of interviewing Scott Myers of selfstorageinvesting.com. Scott, uh, he is one of the, I would like to say, OGs of self-storage. You know, he's, he's been in the game for a very long time. He started investing in 2005, and he has completed over 4 million uh, square feet of self-storage uh, transactions. He does a uh, all, in, all expenses paid short-term mission trip to Mexico every year. They build four to six houses. He's just doing a lot of uh, good things, and he's a wealth of information. Um, and a lot of people that I've worked with have gone through Scott's education program as well. Uh, he's just really a wealth of knowledge and a master in the self-storage industry. So that being said, really hope you enjoy the podcast. I think there's a lot of good content in here. As always, hit the subscribe button and uh, enjoy the show. Pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Sean. Good to see you. Yes, thank you for joining. Uh, so obviously you are one of the self-storage uh, experts. You've been in the industry for a very long time, but for those who don't know you, mm -hmm. uh, can you just go ahead, give us your your backstory and tell us a little bit about your, your journey. Yeah, so um, you know, I walked in a, a room the other day, Sean, and um, somebody said, hey, it's Scott Myers, the OG of self-storage. And so I guess I've, uh, <laughs> I've either arrived or I'm not so sure that I wanna be uh, there, but uh, regardless, uh, I'm, I'm embracing it and stepping into that. Uh, you know, We've been investing in real estate for 30 years and in self-storage for 18, and um, self-storage basically found me. I didn't find self-storage. I was just kind of tired of the tenants, toilets, and trash and all that goes with it. And, and begin to look around the landscape and real estate and, and realize that, uh, you know, if I don't like tenants and toilets, it's uh, parking lots or self-storage. And the more I dug into self-storage, yeah, I like the business model. It's a fairly simple, predictable business model. If people don't uh, pay, you lock them out and you sell their stuff. I mean, what, what isn't there to like about rental real estate when you get to get paid and they can't destroy your property because it's a metal box on a concrete slab. And so so back in 2005, we, um, you know, we sold uh, our apartments and, and our houses. And then my wife and I uh, began investing in self-storage and since then uh, we've grown to you know, we, we acquire existing facilities. That's been the model all along, still do that and all, all value add looking to you know, improve efficiencies in the operations, uh, raise rates, uh, run better, utilize technology, uh, but then the component of development on top of that. So if there's a, another acre or two that we can expand, you know, that is always um, part of the business model. Uh, but then we got into development uh, from the ground up, buying pieces of dirt, and putting self-storage on it and then converting industrial buildings, uh, warehouses and other buildings uh, into self-storage as well, which is probably our favorite and what we're, I, I, I would say, the best at. And then along the way, we um, we created a, an education company. We realized when we got into the business uh, back 18 years ago, you know, there's a couple of books on it, but there wasn't, uh, and you can go to the trade shows, but nobody's really teaching, you know, A to Z, soup to nuts, how, how to find, evaluate, purchase, and manage self-storage facilities and getting into the nuances of creative financing and the capital stack and how to raise private equity and, how, you know, deal structure and, you know, how to plan for an exit strategy and how do you scale and grow. And so we created an education company and the pinnacle of that, we have coaching and mentoring and home study systems and seminars, uh, three-day workshops, really. Uh, and then the pinnacle of that is our mastermind where uh, the A players in the industry and we get together once a quarter and and we do business um, together share best business practices and um, you know are moving forward as a community that's investing together uh, as well so that's uh, i guess the long and short of it got really good at private equity along the way you can't grow to the place where we have with uh, over four million square feet and twenty five thousand units nationwide now uh, without being able to raise private equity and so um, we do that uh, i would say um, uh, up there with uh, the best of them and so that's where i spend most of my time is creating those relationships hey guys real quick hope you're enjoying the show this is Sean from Maven Equities. 
Now, we raise capital for self-storage facilities, uh, self-storage acquisition, self-storage development. So that being said, if you are interested in investing in self-storage, go to my website, mavenequities.com. You can also check us out at mavenstorage.com if you are interested in possibly uh, selling your self-storage facility, or maybe you're a landowner and you're interested in developing self-storage. Um, reach out to us and we would love to work with you, you know, let you know what we think of your, your property or your self-storage facility and see if it's possible to join venture together or maybe um, sell or maybe work together in the future. Uh, anyways, enjoy the show. I think uh, the OG is, is an accurate term. You know, you've been in the game for a lot longer than most people, everybody, even myself included, you know, I've been in the game for a few years now, but um, you've seen a lot, right, from, you so you got in in 2005, so that's obviously prior to the big 2008 uh, recession, um, it's prior to this recession, of course, but then also the market shifted a ton in terms of, hey, self-storage was kind of this, like, almost like third-tier asset class that no one really cared about to it being one of the hottest asset classes there is now. So just kind of curious, like when, for those people like investors who are looking at self-storage now, um, or maybe it's um, operators who want to get into the game now, what do you think about this recession that we're going through compared to prior recessions? And how does this affect the industry? Because obviously interest rates are are going up, you know, it affects cap rates and everything. But like, where do you see see things going? So history tends to repeat itself. And, you know, we, we can you know, point the path to profitability in uh, each recession. And, you know, for those of us that, that have been around, this will be my third, you know, you, you, you learn a few things, you, you, you have a different perspective, and you look a little further down the road, because you know what to expect. And, and although every recession is different, and I, I won't pre pretend to know everything, because, you know, this, this will look different. And, you know, the previous, you know, the first recession I went through in 99, 2000, that was the dot com crash. And that was more of a Wall Street crash. And the last one was banking. It was real estate and, and, and then finance. Um, you know, this one, uh, interest rates are, you know, essentially the same. When I went through in 2007, eight, interest rates were at 8%. And so I, I think everybody's bellyache and they got a little spoiled with, you know, sub 4% uh, percent interest rates of, you know, since uh, 2009, you know, we've seen this steady decline in interest rates. And, and we've all had this, this huge, not only sale, but then this huge wind in our back that has created a lot of uh, money and success for folks. And so what that also does, success is, um, is a horrible educator. And so there's a, a number of folks in, in all forms of real estate and quite honestly in business as well that have had, you know, this uh, maybe, you know, 50% of the success has been as a result of a bull economy uh, that let, let, let's face it and myself included. But so what we'll see, uh, what I see in this recession compared to the last one is a many of the same things that we saw last time. And that is there are some folks that got into self-storage or into different real estate investments and they had this wind in their back and they didn't really you know, dig into and look at the four corners of the business or maybe even treat it like a business. You know, they treated it like a hobby or, you know, income producing real estate, you know, does very well with, with out as much heavy lifting as um, say other small businesses that are very, you know, management intensive, labor intensive and transaction intensive. Um, and so I think maybe some folks um, were a little jaded and they, and they re realized that, Hey, I don't really don't have to do much and I can still make a whole lot of money. And so for us the last time around, you know, we saw those folks that didn't treat their facilities, their self-storage facilities as a business, because it is, it's real estate with a business on top of it. You know, they didn't raise rates. They didn't, um, you know, improve the net operating income, which is the value of their asset. You know, they didn't reduce expenses. Uh, they over payrolled. They hired family members and, and paid them twice as much as what they're worth, but because they needed a job and, you know, they, they failed to appeal the property taxes or do all those things that you need to do that you should have a sense of urgency to do right away. And then when the recession hit and remember when Lehman Brothers fell, you know, I mean, we went off a cliff immediately. And interest rates went up and it became very difficult to for for lenders to open up the pocketbooks again. And so those folks that were caught during that time frame in which they had to refinance, well, 
you know, they got a 90% LTV loan when they bought it, when they bought the facility at 5% interest rate. They didn't build enough value into it. And now they're, they're facing a, a reset of their interest rate, a refinance, because the term is due. Now interest rates are at eight, eight and a half. And the LTV is at 65% because the lenders are a little skittish because we're in, you know, the biggest recession that we've seen <laughs> in, you know, in our nation's history in terms of real estate. And so those folks that didn't create that value, Sean, you know, they, they showed up to the closing table either with the keys to the facility because they had to give it back to the bank um, or with a big old bunch of money, a, a bag of money to make up for the shortfall to be able to keep their property. And so I, I think we're seeing, we're going to see those same things again. And we are, we are seeing some of those things again, where you know, folks are getting caught out. Either they bought a facility that was, you know, it, it wasn't a huge value add, and so they couldn't push the value much. It just wasn't there, and now they're facing a refinance or a rate reset. Um, or the folks that just didn't, couldn't, um, or didn't do a good enough job of creating that value, and so, you know, we'll see that happen again. I think uh, Morgan Stanley just stated that uh, roughly, uh, let me see, of the five trillion dollars in loans that were written um, in commercial real estate in from 2020 up till today about 2 trillion, so almost half of those are are behind and roughly 40%, the, the real estate, the underlying real estate is, um, uh, the valuation is 40% less than when the loan was written. So that's gonna spell a lot of disaster for a lot of folks and 450 billion is the most recent figure that I saw coming out to market that is um, in trouble um, this year alone. By the end of this year, that's gonna be um, coming up, uh, you know, for sale, have to be reset, you know, may go to foreclosure, but most likely negotiated in terms of a short sale or, um, or some type of, um, uh, you know, the owner having to do something to be able to keep their their real estate so not not painting a grim picture by any stretch i mean it's an opportunity for all of us on the acquisition side that's that's what we've been preparing for since 2009 and 10. i i saw a whole lot of folks my my peers you know do a huge land grab because they had the cash you know to you know participate either assist help do joint ventures with these folks who are in trouble or just buy the asset and uh, we recognized and realized pretty quickly that you know we could have cleaned house if we'd had the cash and so we've been preparing for this since then and we've got private equity more of it we've got good lenders and so you know when those projects uh, come to the market and probably q3 and four more of them those troubled assets yeah you know, we will be in the in a place in a position to be able to help some of those folks along or be able to purchase those assets so that's our master plan that's amazing. That's awesome. Um, well, I mean, it's awesome for you to be in that position. Obviously, for mm -hmm. people who uh, are in a bad position, it's it's not good, right? And it's time Correct. to kind of yeah. yeah. Nobody to likes think to see about that. it. No, no, no. We don't want to see see anybody. You don't. Nobody likes to win based on somebody else's. Um, I don't know loss where they're really going down. Uh, Correct. But at, at the same time, right? For those owners who have. Mm -hmm self-storage facilities and maybe their note is coming due maybe it's like the five-year fixed interest rate mm -hmm. is coming up like here in 2023 what do you tell those people right because hey i mean you want to work with them right like it's, yep. that's yep. an opportunity maybe to mm -hmm. jv together or maybe yeah. it's just to sell outright like mm -hmm. what do you have any advice for those those people yeah well first of all i don't give advice sean <laughs> we're not a financial advisor uh only experience we share experience but we've got a lot of it we've seen a lot um as you mentioned you know we've been at this uh, for a little while and so we've gotten we've gotten pretty good at you know creative structures in a capital stack and then also you know digging into a troubled asset and how do we get ourselves out of this you know what are the options and so you know as you can imagine you know we've been at this for a little while and you know i write articles uh, on self-storage for forbes magazine and I speak at the industry trade shows. And so there's a whole lot of folks when, when uh, trouble begins to brew, you know, by way of our podcast and otherwise, you know, they find us they, and they come to our organization and uh, they're, they're seeking help. And so, you know, our staff and, and myself, you know, we, we, we look at a lot of projects and, and we just provide options. And so many of those are, I mean, it, it's really just, you know, dismantling it. You know, let's take a look at the underlying debt. Let's take a look at your valuation. What is a true valuation? How much cash do you have? How, how quickly can you create value? You know, does it make sense to sell now? What's your runway? What's the time frame? And, and unfortunately, Sean, it's, you know, I, I think maybe sometimes pride and, and maybe, in a, and I mean this in a polite way, a, ignorance, I mean, ignorance of how much time they truly have left. You know, people just don't maybe understand or realize that, oh, you should have sounded the alarms, you know, three months ago. And now, you know, you, your, your options are limited because you're out of time. Um, so, you know, we, we look at the time that people have left, you know, what kind of a runway they have in terms of their, their burn rate, their cash, and, you know, how is their credit? What other assets uh, do they have? And just, you know, look at ways that we can structure and just provide options, um, you know, and that's everything from, 
you know, you got time, you need to sell it now, you know, let's, you know, based, based on our calculations and, and a cap rate on your NOI, looking back 12 months, here's what we think it would trade in, in the marketplace. Um, do you need a cash injection to, you know, get over the hump or to make it to stabilization or to stave off, you know, the bank uh, resetting or calling a loan due, you know, well, what are those options? And, you know, can we perhaps participate and provide some of those uh, options? Um, is it um, is it just a restructuring of their debt altogether? Can they maybe do something, moving some cash around from some other uh, assets? You know, so anything from selling joint ventures, bringing in uh, other partners, um, restructuring the debt, putting new debt on it, um, or just uh, you know going back to the bank and you know having them assist or participate and really have them maybe stretch their LTVs in a refinance or you know negotiate depending upon the lender. You know, sometimes they don't have a very you know, they may not have a rigid box in which they have to operate from and they have that flexibility. So you know there there literally are you know a hundred ways from Sunday you know to use the cliche of you know restructuring a, a project that may be in trouble and and many times um you know or sometimes you know there isn't any option it's just hey you need to move quickly and you need to sell and lick your wounds and move on yep i uh i can see all that happening but i think it's good for folks to know that hey they can like they don't have to always sell they can go like you said they could partner with you joint venture you know you could bring a capital injection and really get through this time or even even having a a good JV partner right can help you get better debt. The banks are looking at you. They see all of your experience. They see four million square feet of self storage that you've um, done transactions on. So it's like, hey, this is um, you know maybe we can give you better terms than if you were to go to the bank by yourself, right? And you're just a single person, single operator, and it's a local bank, and they're worried. That that being said, like you've done, you know pretty much everything, right? From the syndication side, the capital raising side, the development conversions, um, acquisitions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about developments? Like, are you are you develop, like focused on developing now? Is that a big part of your, your company? Or is it more like, hey, we're just getting ready to acquire because we know we see opportunity coming here in this, the next uh, two quarters? Yeah, you know, the, I- interesting, Sean. Um... You know, at the in the last recession, you know, heading into it when, you know, the banks basically shut down, you know, they weren't doing anything in by way of development in, in terms of any development loans. You know, anything speculative was off the table, not not even a, a discussion. And many of those banks are taking that posture right now that we're seeing. But it but it's interesting. We've had, you know, again, every recession is a little bit different as we're heading into this one. You know, we've had supply chain issues and delays for from, you know, a, any side, all sides in a development project just spells over budget. You know, it spells, you know, an increase in the development of a project uh, on top of the increase in raw materials, you know, supplies. Um, the steel prices have gone up, you know, several hundred percent um, since, um, you know, before COVID. And, and then transportation costs, because the cost of transportation, you know, it, it just is compounded. And so we're, we're paying considerably more in terms of dollars per square foot to, to develop However, the good news is, you know, self-storage, as you mentioned, um, you know, it used to be that, uh, you know, the, um, well, it was the ugly stepsister of commercial real estate until it became the Cinderella, you know, in the bell of the ball and the returns are strong. And that's because as we head into a recession, yeah, it is, um, we, we are needs based and demand based. And when there's trauma and transition in the economy, self-storage benefits. And so as a result of COVID in, in the past two years, you know, our rental rate increases have gone up in step you know, with that increase in development prices. So we, we've stayed at, you know, in pretty even keel in terms of, you know, both going up and to the, to the right, although we don't like, you know, the cost of doing business going up, but rental rates have been strong. And so we do have lenders um, that, that have seen, uh, seen that and understand it. And, you know, you talk with many investors out there like myself that have been at this business for a while and they say, well, we can't really find any projects right now that pencil out. We, you know, we can't find the value now that is, you know, kind of dried up. The low hanging fruit is uh, gone. And so we're not really in, in a position to be able to, to handle that right now. Um, however, We've uh, we've seen uh, development costs that um, you know in terms of um, you know they've gone up a bit, but the yield in development is there, and so you know the, it, it has stayed just as strong. And so uh, from that standpoint, you know investors are looking still at developing as a viable option as we hit into the recession until maybe the banks say no and they lower the LTVs down so much, or if um, prices increase again. So 
a long way to answer to your question. And, uh, you know, I don't want to answer everything with it depends, but that's, uh, that's the way we're approaching development right now. Got it. Got it. Do you have any development projects underway currently? We do. Uh, we've got one that is uh, getting ready to uh, open right now. We've got another one that is getting ready to uh, break ground in uh, Virginia. And we've got uh, two others that we're looking at uh, at the moment. We got a conversion that's about halfway done. We're getting ready to start another phase of it. So, and uh, one more that's coming down the pipeline. And then another um, part of the world that we're looking at um, uh, doing some development in as well as uh, the middle class uh, continues to emerge in, um, in other parts of the, uh, of the world. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's um, that's good. Now, are you you typically do Class A facilities, right? We're talking like like indoor climate controlled mm -hmm. facilities. Are you are you do you ever dip your toe into the Class B or Class C facilities, yeah. where it's more drive up self storage, or is it just that's not where your company is is best? Um, that's putting the resources mm -hmm. into. Yes, to all the above. <laughs> you know, the the business started with Class C facilities, taking them of Class C, you know, mom and pop operation in a secondary tertiary market, and taking it to a solid B, B plus. You know, it's never going to be an A, but you know, we can we can take that and create value in it. Um, you know, drive the NOI by increasing rates, running it better, utilizing technology, and uh, and improving the curb appeal and security, and you know, all those other ancillary income streams, and running it and treating it like a business. That's been our bread and butter our model and uh, we do that very very well and continue to do that to this day we we have a 25 million dollar fund that we uh, just filled up and we've got our our last three assets which are all that they're classy facilities going into it but we know we're going to have um, a, a 2x almost 3x return once we stabilize those properties and and do what we do in creating value the, the the development side is nothing but class a so you know those are um, almost almost exclusively, you know, two and three story, 100% temperature controlled facilities uh, positioned in markets and, and at a site and a location that a REIT would want to buy it. And that is by design, you know, that, that would be the exit is to roll up our portfolio and then sell it off to a larger player, whether it be a national fund or a REIT. Uh, we're also developing class A single story drive up climate control, which is what we've seen our consumer wants. They, they, want, the, uh, they want the flexibility of being able to drive up to the units rather than going in with a cart and narrow halls an elevator and making multiple trips, but they also want climate control. They want temperature control um, to store their goods in. And so, you know, if it makes sense um, and we have, you know, a larger parcel, a four or five acre parcel, then we'll develop single story, all climate controlled. Um, again, just depending upon the, the climate and cost of concrete and uh, again, all things being equal. So we are doing uh, all of the above class A, B and C. If we can create value um, in it and with it, then um, we'll do it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, people are willing to pay more if they can drive up to the facility mm, and you know, drop their stuff right off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so once you start getting three stories up and you have to get in the elevator and stuff, you're just not going to maximize your mm -hmm. rental rate per per square foot. So mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's it's not always easy to build 100,000 or 75,000 square not. feet all first first level. Yeah, no, it's not. Development of any sort is not for the faint of heart, period. <laughs> I think a lot of self storage facility owners right now are seeing a decrease in rental rates, a decrease in occupancy overall. Um, and I think that's due to interest rates, right? The housing market has just slowed down, mm -hmm. or almost stopped, right? Where mm -hmm. people aren't moving. It's just not the same demand as it was during right. uh, mm -hmm. like COVID mm -hmm. uh, when everybody, there's a lot of just a lot of money out there and mm -hmm. self storage is kind of a, it's an extra extra thing and an extra cost. And so, you know, I guess what are you doing at your facilities to kind of counteract that, mm -hmm. right? Counteract mm -hmm. the the decrease in yeah. in occupancy and try to balance that out. Yeah, you know, that, that's interesting. Again, as we as we look to the the past and the last recession, um, again, we're we're demand based. We are needs based. You know, we could we don't send out necessarily. Some owners, operators will, but we don't send out coupons in a valve pack, you know, like people do for dry cleaning and a haircut. Most people are going to need um, their clothes dry cleaned and a haircut eventually, and they'll use that coupon. 
um, storage is demand based, it's need based. And as you mentioned, it's, you know, many times when there's a lot of activity in the marketplace on the single family side, when people are buying houses and moving and they're trading in, trading up, you know, they're going to stage their house first because the, the agent told them to get all the kids' plastic stuff out and make it look like there's more room. And then they'll put their stuff in storage when they're getting ready uh, to move and they, they may keep it there for a fair amount of time. Or if they're going to remodel in their new home as well, you know, they'll, they'll put all their stuff in, in there or what was going to, going to go in the basement of their old house is going to go in the basement of the new and they have to remodel. And so they'll put that in storage. You know, we've seen, you know, some of that has a, uh, slowed and that has called a, a, a or caused a leveling off of rates. You know, we've seen, you know, not as much of an uptake and leveling off of rates, but we haven't seen much of a downturn. So when we get into, as you mentioned, you know, when people don't have as much disposable income and in that in storage is a luxury, yeah, in some instances, but primarily the demand is still needs based. And so as we head into a recession, you know, like we saw even with the pandemic, the pandemic mimicked, uh, you know, a recession. And immediately when, there was a lockdown. There was a lot of businesses that, that, that shut down and they, they put their excess inventory into storage because they lost their building or they gave up their lease or, or they were subleasing now a certain amount of space because their business had declined and they put their extra inventory or they put their extra office equipment and, you know, uh, or other manufacturing equipment into storage. When uh, folks either lost their jobs or they were sent home. Um, many times they had to create a, a work environment at home for one or two wage earners. And then schools were shut down and the kids came home. So now they had to create a classroom in the home. And so the dining room furniture, the formal dining room furniture, you know, a lot of the stuff in the spare bedroom and uh, you know, went elsewhere in the house went into storage. And so we all saw a huge surge in demand for self-storage and, uh, and rate increases year over year of double digits. Um, in some cases, month over month, double digits. And so, again, that mimics a recession. You know, we're going to see, as we're seeing right now, businesses slowing down. There will be businesses as we head deeper into the recession that will go under. Um, they will put excess inventory or goods into storage. You know, people may lose jobs and they may need to downsize like we saw back in uh, 08, move back home, move in with each other. And there's stuff they're not going to get rid of, and they'll put that in storage. And we still have the demand of the baby boomers that are retiring. They're, they're downsizing their homes, putting it in storage, going to assisting living, uh, assisted living, downsizing again. And then when they pass on, you know, the kids get their stuff and they put it in storage because it doesn't all fit in their house, but they're not going to get rid of it. So the demand for storage is still remains um, very steady and, and very strong. It's just that those demands that the market is a driving shift as we head into a recession, if that makes sense. Right. No, that makes complete sense. Um, you're a Midwest guy, right? You're from uh, Indiana. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Yep. So I'm from, I'm in Michigan and uh, both Midwest people here, you mm -hmm. know, and I love the Midwest and I love the Midwest mm -hmm. market. Um, and really like, I would like to focus on developing here, but yeah. everybody seems to be moving South, right? It's like the mm -hmm. developments are yep. all going on in Texas or in mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now I know you mentioned Virginia. I don't know what other States you're, mm -hmm. you're in, but are you, your development projects, like, I guess, are you focused more on the South and, and I don't know why, like what it is, but <laughs> yeah. here, right. You could have mm -hmm. a, a market and it's getting, maybe you're getting like a dollar 50 a month in, in rent, um, for a climate mm -hmm. controlled mm -hmm. unit, right. On average, mm -hmm. but in Florida, right. You're getting $2 and 50 cents. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you start putting that on a cap rate and you start looking at evaluation. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, why even waste your time uh, up yeah. here when there's that, but mm -hmm. also there's the competition. So, um, mm -hmm. just curious in, in terms of like markets where you want to be at, or if you're saying, yeah. if you're still looking in the Midwest too at developments. Well, grass is always greener, right? Um, and it'll continue to always be greener for the investor that is searching for, you know, the self-storage Oz, you know, where all, you know, streets are made of gold and rental rates are $3 a foot and they can buy, you know, land for, you know, $10 an acre. Um, you know, that is one of, you know, one of the benefits of the Midwest is that uh, our cost per acre for land to develop is, is less expensive than some of the more desirable plots in, say, Florida or in, in, in Texas, essentially. Um, I think much of the money and much of the development is in, in the Sunbelt states because there's a lot of activity people moving there and you just have a massive population uh, again we have a fairly it's, this is not an easy business because no business is easy but it's a it's a fairly simple and predictable business model and you can drop me into any market and and even a sub market and, and a market for a self storage facility is you know, really less than but you know a five mile radius you know if I found a plot of ground uh, for sale 
I draw a ring around it or, you know, depending upon the natural barriers with highways and rivers, you know, with the drive time, you know, I, I can understand that if there's, you know, more than seven, eight square foot of self-storage per person, eh, it might start to get a little bit oversupplied. But if it's less than six or five, most likely going to be undersupplied, greater demand and, and higher rental rates. So all, all things being equal. So I think the drive and the push to Florida and Texas is, uh, has been a result of COVID. You know, there's been a, a, a movement from the more difficult states to do business in or, or live in, you know, quite honestly, from, you know, uh, the blue states to the red states. Um, that, that's where you see the migration and just it's nicer, uh, nicer climate. And people don't have to uh, as businesses recognize that people can be productive working from home, we don't have to bring them back in the office. Um, you know, and I can say this, Sean, I know you're a Michigan guy and I, I grew up there. You know, if, if your business is located in Flint, Michigan, well, you don't have to live there. <laughs> now you can move to Florida. And if your company allows it, you know, you can do work from home. And so, uh, you know, no offense to anybody in Flint, Michigan, that's my hometown. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to get those rental rates, you know, in a market that is still declining in, in certain, you know, cities and markets uh, throughout the, the country. So, again, and I, and I always I want to be the optimist, um, but also a realist at the same time. And that you know, land is is less expensive in the Midwest. Demand is still there, and if the numbers pencil out, you know it, what what may appear to be you know grand slam home runs just by moving and going to another state. All things being equal, it may be more expensive for the land and everything else, and so your yield is roughly the same. So. You know, as long as the population isn't, you know, dropping dramatically in a particular market, there's always going to be demand. And as population is, you know, increasing or even staying steady, you know, I can go to pretty much any market in Michigan, Sean, and, and probably find a, you know, within a five mile radius, a plot of ground where there's a demand for storage that is not being met and there, and there needs to be a development. Yep. Yep, I agree with you. Yeah, I should have noted. I see the winged helmet in the background. Uh, so see that, that the Michigan Michigan <laughs> yep. helmet. I didn't realize you were from Flint. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Everybody has to be from somewhere. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yep. So you, you mentioned earlier that you uh, have a syndicate or sorry, a fund, right? And so mm -hmm. in the beginning, I'm guessing you were yeah. doing individual syndications yes. on every deal mm -hmm. you did, like five mm -hmm. or six C syndications, raising mm -hmm. the capital on a deal by mm -hmm. deal basis. How long mm -hmm. have you been, have you moved over to um, doing the fund model and mm -hmm. how has that shown success for you versus like raising mm -hmm. capital on a deal by deal mm -hmm. basis? Yeah, good question. There, there's pros and cons to both. Um, I kind of went kicking and screaming into the fund um, only because um, I'm, 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 I'm a risk taker when it's my own money and my own butt on the line. And I do have a, a lot of confidence and, you know, in myself and in and, and my experience, but I never want to go into a deal with somebody else's money and, and being, you know, a little too overconfident. And, and when you raise capital in a fund in a blind pool, you're pulling their money in and then you need to be confident enough that you're going to go find a project in a very short time frame that is going to match the returns that you have projected and offered to your, your investors. And so I, I, I've, I've heard of some folks that have just regretted it and, and have not had success and they didn't meet their projections and some that had had a worse experience with their, you know, for their investors, if you will. And, and I never want to put myself, Sean, in a position where I, I took investors capital and I had to deploy it and I didn't have the means to do so, you know, identified right away. And so that forces you, I think, to make bad decisions as an investor, because now you're going to buy something. It may not meet your buy box and you're acquisition criteria or development criteria, but you're going to do it because you got a distribution coming up to your investors and they're going to see something and, and you may be tapped out and you don't want to provide, you know, that those returns and those distributions from cash or somewhere else. So it, it could be a slippery slope and I never want to put myself in that position. So, um, the model of syndication, however, you know, you get the deal and then you run like mad, right? <laughs> you get under contract and you scramble and you go out to your, your, your private equity list. You do your due diligence, you you hold a webinar and, and you, you bang the phones and, and you put the offering memorandums out in front of folks. And, um, if they, they've got a, a good relationship with you, they know, like, and trust you, and you've made money for them before you're making money for them. Now you raise the money, 50,000, a hundred thousand at a time. And you're able to fill up that, you know, do that deal, you know, for 10 million by raising two and a half to 3 million, um, challenges. You got to do that and get people to move their money around, get it all in before you're at the end of your due diligence. And you may fall out of contract. You know, there's a seller who doesn't want to wait around for you to do what you need to do because they got a cash offer waiting in the wings. And so, you know, those, those are the pros and cons of, uh, of both. Um, the blind pool is great. 
when you have a healthy pipeline and we had a healthy pipeline and we were getting ready to m- lose out on some projects. And so when you're ready to lose out on projects because you don't have the capital and your and your pipeline is robust, that's the time to step into a fund. That gives you the confidence to know that you're going to be able to find the project. Your marketing is hitting on all cylinders. You know What you're seeing in the markets you're operating in um, gives you enough confidence that you're going to be able to find or that the deal flow is coming to you. That's when you do a fund. When things slow down a little bit, I'd rather go back to a more safe model where I find the deal first that's going to produce the returns, and then I, I put the private equity uh, into it. So we're getting ready to start another fund. It was going to be $50 million. We're going to back that down to $25 uh, million, and that's going to be more of an opportunistic fund, which allows us to do a, a few different things rather than just value-add facilities. So, again, keeping it conservative in terms of our returns and our ability uh, to fill not only the fund, but then also to fill it with the properties that are going to you know, source the, you know, the returns for our investors. So, again, long-winded answer to your question, but you know, we, we approach it both ways, and there's pros and cons to both ways. Yeah, that's that's uh, very cool. I mean, twenty million—that's a that's a big fund, but that just shows mm-hmm. you know with your track record and people still want to invest. There's still capital out there, and mm-hmm. people are looking for for good deals. Um, mm-hmm. And self storage is still like a very proven asset class, uh, and mm-hmm. it's done very very well overall um, compared mm-hmm. to. I mean, most other like real estate asset classes, and and of course the stock market. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned before the call that you do, uh, you know, and I've heard of this before, but you do mission trips to mm-hmm. Mexico with your company mm-hmm. every year. And I've seen pictures of those. Those look really cool. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And also mm-hmm. you said, you, you know, your company, you give back. Um, mm-hmm. And so I didn't know, I guess, do those some of your funds or some of your profits go into mm-hmm. building homes in Mexico? Just mm-hmm. tell us tell us a little bit yeah. about that part of your business. Well, yeah. And, and you know. We could talk for another hour on that. Uh, that's our passion, is our is our mission, and in our in our work in the mission field. And from the beginning, my wife and I, you know, the giving was always a part of this uh, of our business, and the, the flexibility and the freedom, you know, that self storage has you know brought for our, ourselves and our family has just been uh, incredible. You know, these things cash flow like crazy, and you know we don't have the tenants and the toilets and the trash like we had with our apartment. So you know we could go on a cruise, and you know, if our cell phone doesn't work, guess what? You know, there's no sense of urgency. There's no pipes. And no people living in our storage units, so you know it gave us the freedom to be able to go out and do what we wanted to do, and 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 that meant um, also in the beginning, is that uh, we give ten percent of our profits uh, back to the mission field, and uh, we landed on building houses in uh, in Mexico, and so yeah, we take our family, our friends, coworkers, neighbors, vendors, partners. Now, anybody who really wants to go on a mission trip uh, with us, uh, we pay for the whole trip. We pay for the houses. Uh, we pay for the trip, um, except for everybody's airfare to San Diego. And um, we we go on these four-day family-friendly mission trips. You know, we, we partner with YWAM, Youth with a Mission. It's a, a global organization, mission organization. And their division called Homes of Hope um, is in, in charge of building the houses. And so we partner with them. And what I mean by partner is they provide um, the the slab, the concrete slab. When we show up, they have a base that is absolutely beautiful in Ensenada, uh, Mexico, which is a, a cruise ship, a port, and a very safe environment. And in, in four days, two days of travel on the front and the back end, and two days to build, um, we bring families down with kids as young as uh, six years old and up. And uh, they see what it's like to be able to build a house, work alongside of some folks, and uh, understand how you know, 90 plus percent of the rest of the world operates. And at the end of two days, we're able to hand the keys over to a deserving family and end generational poverty one family at a time. And we're doing two of these trips a year now, building three to four houses uh, each each and every time. We've got in June, we're heading down again, and we're taking a a group of 80 people to go down and build uh, three houses uh, with us and um, attracting some other you know, financial partners along with that. You know, if we if we open it up and we make it free for people to come, you know, that is part of our mission field for them to have the experience that uh, that they will have, or you know, what God has in mind for them when when they get there. But many of our folks have had an incredible experience, and and then they've modeled what we're doing, and they've taken that back to their organizations, and they're giving back by building more houses, and they're doing it along with us as well. And so the ripple effect, you know, we never. We we didn't have any idea what the ripple effect would be when we started, Sean. But it's um it's been pretty awesome to see over the years, you know, the cool things that folks that have gone on these trips with us that they're doing, and and not just building houses, but other missions, mission work and charity work that um you know as a result of going on this trip, you know, their heart was changed, their mind was changed, and they got changed somehow 
when they were there and uh, now doing some great things um, in the world and, and giving back. And, you know, we've realized that, you know, if you have an open hand, um, money's always going to flow through it. It'll go out um, and it'll come back in. And so that's just been part of our DNA from the beginning. And, you know, pretty soon my wife and I will be, I'd say within the next 10 years, uh, we're going to flip the script and we'll spend 80% of our time uh, on our mission efforts and, and raising more funds and awareness to, to do that. And 20% of our time in the business just to keep it moving and hiring good lieutenants to make sure that it ha that, that, that happens so we can do what we have a passion to do. That's fantastic. I think there's there's a lot to be said to for just, you know, getting, getting your hands uh, on just, mm. you know, wood and building materials yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, actually doing it like we all sit behind our computers mm -hmm. and behind our desks yeah. uh pretty much all day all day long even as self-storage owners mm -hmm. and operators right like we're not there yeah. at the facilities like cleaning up but mm -hmm. um you know we have teams and people who do that so to actually get out and mm -hmm. physically work i think that's fantastic and it's uh it's those, I those sore it's very muscles satisfying. And, and sore back yeah. and and your smashed thumb and your blisters never felt so good at the end of two days <laughs> right right so in a couple days you're building an entire house is what you're yeah, saying build an entire, an entire house in two days yeah that's incredible that's incredible mm -hmm. and then the the company that you were or the um non that you mm -hmm. partner with they are choosing like families in some way Correct. to yeah they do all the okay. legwork and um as, as you can imagine they have a whole lot of folks that apply and uh, they go through a very uh, rigorous vetting and screening process i mean it, it's sad at the end of the day that um, not everybody qualifies or is able to get a home um sure. but the good news is is that um you know the people that are truly in need in the most need and and deserving because yep. of a hardship that they are the ones that are uh, they getting the houses and um the incredible life change and family change that uh, what well, that we see in that family and then that we um, also receive um, as a result of um, helping and coming alongside of them is, um, yeah, I, I am longing for the day when we do and are spending 80% of our time making a bigger difference in the world rather than doing what we're doing in self-storage. But that's yeah. the avenue. That's, that's, that's the awesome. facet and that's the vehicle that makes it happen. That's awesome. Are you going to, you said you go to San Diego and then are you driving down there? Yeah. Does everybody drive from San Diego across we the border? We take charter and... buses and um, we supply those and um, luxury coaches cool. and we go across the border. We go across um, as a group and it's um, very quick and painless. And uh, it's an hour and a half drive down Highway 1, which, um, you know, if you you know, close your eyes. It's the same as California, which, um, you know, beauty knows no bounds. And, uh, we go, we drive, uh, down yeah. alongside the ocean and the cliffs. And then we land there at the ocean city of, uh, Ensenada, Mexico, which is just a beautiful town and, um, just fantastic folks and, uh, and just a great venue and setting for us to be able to do our work. Well, Scott, uh, I just have a couple more questions mm -hmm. for you. Uh, one is, do you have any like tech recommendations. I always like to ask people that uh, tech mm -hmm. recommendations or book recommendations. And then yeah. of course, how do people get in touch with you? You know, if they want to get involved just on the mm -hmm. self storage side, or they want to get involved in um, the mission trips, just mm -hmm. uh, learn more about, you know, your company, mm -hmm. where do they go? Sure. So book recommendations. Um, I mean, there's, there, there's a handful that are still on my desk at all times that I uh, refer to and go back to over and over again. And we have a, uh, we have a new, uh, somebody coming in at the C-suite level into our organization and they're learning uh, about traction. So if you haven't read the book, uh, Traction um, and the Entrepreneur Operating uh, System, that is uh, one of our, our handbooks around here. And uh, and we operate um, under that um, and utilize uh, those tools and have uh, implemented it uh, very well. So uh, I'd point people to uh, that if you run a small business. Um, at the end of the day, there's multiple systems and ways of being able to do it. We've just found that Traction is the one that uh, has allowed us to gain the most traction. Um, in terms of uh, on the tech side, I would say all, you know, on that, in that same vein, um, you know, Keith Cunningham, how to build, um, oh gosh, a, a wildly successful business, another good book, but within that, you know, he stresses dashboards and then in business, you know, it's, it's much like sports or anything else. Um, if you don't know what the dashboard is or how to read, or excuse me, the scoreboard and, and you don't know how to read it and understand how to score and, and who wins, then you, you really don't have a business and you're not going to make it very long. And so, you know, getting a good set of uh, books, it starts with books and whether you're using QuickBooks or not, um, and, and having somebody who can then provide the, the reports, but then putting it into a dashboard and so that you know what levers to pull 
to make a, an effect or a change in your organization and also know when to you know put those alarms in place that you know this is a threshold that is unacceptable and those alarms go off and everybody jumps in um, you know again if you don't know the plays if you don't know how to read the the scoreboard you're you're really flying blind and um, and if you're successful in business um, it, it has been luck and, and it may catch up to you so I, I would say on the tech side, getting a good, strong um, financial dashboard. Um, Fathom HQ is is one of those out there that's a good model. There's a there's a number of them to be able you know to look at, and you know they're they're bolt ons, and they you know there's a AI um, or excuse me an API link you know from QuickBooks and multiple ways of getting data in there, but. Um, I think you need to have a dashboard to understand, you know, what's going on with your business. If you're running low, <laughs> if you're ready to overheat or if you're running low on gas, those are things that you need to know in your business. I just wanted to touch on that. Is yeah. that similar to like the EOS scorecards? Like you mentioned traction, entrepreneurial you know, I, operating system. I would system. say so. You know, the EOS scorecard okay. is very rudimentary. You know, it could be in Excel. We put ours in Smartsheet uh, and that just measures and tracks our KPIs. Um, but essentially, yep. I'm looking at, call it a macro level or a really granular level, you know, in terms of, you know, calculating your burn rate, your, your cash flow and your burn rate. You know, what is the effective effectiveness uh, of your employee? You know, how much revenue is every employee generating in your business? And so, you know, having access to those, that, that type of data to be able to make those decisions, you know, when do you hire somebody and, um, you know, is somebody producing enough and is another headcount, is that actually going to produce more income or is it truly just an expense um, right now that offloads some of the work so that the other people can be successful and, and how much more successful, you know, how does that weigh out? You know, what is the, the return on uh, that, you know, additional headcount and that additional um, salary? And if you're scaling fast, um, you know, again, those are some of the decisions that um, if you don't have a good dashboard to understand what that looks like, um, you may be uh, lucky or you may find yourself um, unlucky if you haven't done it correctly. Yeah, that's uh, that's very good to know. I, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. very curious about that. I'm going to look into it after mm -hmm. after we're done with this podcast. I was also curious, you said the EOS model, um, yeah. you know, you typically have like a visionary and an integrator. Mm -hmm. Are you in both roles right now? Do you consider yourself <laughs> like the visionary and the integrator? Like, uh, how do you how do you look at that? Or do you have those really separated out? Yeah, no, there is no separation. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, if we want to talk about predictive index and enneagrams and all that, I'm an enneagram nine, and so I'm the peacemaker, but I also have control issues, and so I'm still integrating, even though I'm the visionary. Yeah. <laughs> so right. I'm. It's I am hard. the visionary, and that is my role um, in terms of the the integrator. You know what I'm doing in terms of uh, you know execution. Um, yes, there's, there, I, I'm involved in in meetings, and I'm involved in uh, key meetings and uh, interviews with folks, and uh, I'm also in charge of growing the brand, and that's mostly from a private equity standpoint, but also from uh, a, a posturing standpoint uh, for our brand and our business, and I'm um, just going out and seeking you know different and, and bigger opportunities in terms of joint ventures and and, and advancing the brand. Uh, on the day to day execution, however you know the uh, the the raising of capital from syndications to growing the retail side and kind of overseeing the marketing uh, to that or the messaging you know is, is somewhat of a visionary role um but also ultimately you know i i do sean tend to I, I i don't demand perfection but i expect excellence in my organization and so um when when information goes out content goes out i don't look at it all i mean my folks are really good i've got really good lieutenants underneath but some of those critical pieces i need to just make sure you know i step in every once in a while to make sure that yep. what's going out is my voice um if you're raising capital or if you're growing a brand and people want to do business with you if they're doing business with somebody in your organization or they see a content piece that goes out an article a blog post or anything else and it's not your voice people see through that and you know sure. if they're going to know like and trust and work with us especially if they're going to use their hard-earned dollars to invest with us in, in their in the private equity side of the business then yeah we, we need to be succinct and we need to make sure that the messaging is uh, is correct and that um, there is no no question that uh, we are the same uh, yesterday today and and tomorrow and and everything that we do is you know pointing towards one thing and is profitability for our business and profitability for our investors that, that come alongside of us. That's fantastic. Well, Scott, uh, thanks for being on. What's the best way for, for people to reach out to you or to get involved? Yeah, selfstorageinvesting.com is the mothership. And uh, we do have tabs that go over to our other sites for our mastermind, as well as uh, how to invest passively with us in our in our passive investments and in our fund. Uh, but to learn about the business, to learn about uh, us, um, and, and a lot of free tools and free resources and white papers, selfstorageinvesting.com is, uh, is the place to start. 
to where everything happens. Okay. Link to our podcast as well as to, to be able to listen to those as well, as you mentioned, uh, Sean. So, um, yeah, that's the place to start. And, of course, I'm, a, I'm, I'm out there on all the socials as well. You just type in Scott Meyer Self Storage, and last count, there's about 40,000 impressions uh, all over the place. So uh, I'm not hard to find. And your podcast, too, right? Your podcast, you put out your great content and every podcast. week. podcast, yeah. The Self Storage Podcast. Yeah, yep. Uh, that is a labor of love, and it is um, that has changed a lot of lives as well. And uh, I love to do it, having conversations, and like the one you and I are having, Sean, just talk about the business and and uh, you know advance people and answer the questions. Is I you know, just love talking about it. Everybody at home is tired awesome. of me talking about self storage, so it's great to get on a podcast and talk to other <laughs> folks about it. <laughs> That's my outlet. I know, I know. My wife doesn't want to hear any more about it. <laughs> yep, yep. I hear you. Okay. Well, Scott, it's been great having you on. I really appreciate you taking the time and getting on here and just talking about it. Um, sounds like you're, you know, you're doing great things and the mission trip stuff is just very cool. Uh, My pleasure, Sean. Great to so, connect again. All right. Thanks. We'll talk later. Take care. Bye. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, as always hit the subscribe button down below. Um, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, all under the gentle art of crushing it. Um, I will be continue to host you know, approximately once a month or so, and my focus is always self-storage. Um, but, uh, yep, hit the subscribe, and uh, thanks for listening. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.